Architect and Uber is one of those classic system design interview problems that almost everyone gets. And with the change in landscape since the last two to three years, as you know, companies have been focusing on adding AI features around their product, which leads to the fact that almost every developer position nowadays is expected to know something about AI and be able to justify why they would choose certain AI feature over another one. Now, I did a little challenge for myself and architected Uber's system by incorporating AI into it, meaning some AI features. And in this video, we're gonna take a look at that. We're gonna learn some interesting design patterns, some interesting techniques, and see how AI can be used at Uber from my perspective. We're gonna be using Ice Panel for this, which is a really cool diagramming and modeling tool for such complex architectures. And you're gonna see all the benefits as we go in this video. And as any respectable software architect, we gotta choose the way we're gonna be architecting our system. So there are different models that you can go with, for example, four plus one or C4, and there are some other ones, but C4 is one of those famous ones that I also like, and it's also widely used. So C4 stands for, for different four levels of abstraction, starting with the context level, then container level, component level, as well as the code level. Context level in this case is called software system, but it's the same thing. So it gives you four different ways of abstraction and how deep your system can be described. Now the code one is not that common, so people usually omit it, but we can already start with the first one, which is called context. And this is perfect for scenarios when you want to create a diagram or an architecture and want to show it for stakeholders that are not technical, meaning they don't understand your technical jargon, but you still want to explain them how your ecosystem works. So Ice Panel actually has a really cool feature called Flows. I already created one flow from the rider's perspective, so a person who wants to order a taxi, and let's see how it's gonna interact. So rider requests a ride from the app. We are going to get a request in the Uber's app or in the Uber's ecosystem. Uber's ecosystem is going to interact with the Maps API. In this case, it's TomTom API because it's a very good API for Maps. We're also going to fetch some AI data or pull AI data. In this case, it's open AI, but it can be an in-house solution as well. We're gonna talk about that. We're going to interact with Stripe as a payment provider because we don't want to handle payments ourselves. It's too complex. We have too many countries to cover. And we also are using Twilio to be able to send messages, emails, and push notifications to our riders. Now, this is the context level. This is the very first level. Now looking at our C4 model, next one is called container level. Container level is basically, now if we drill down into our app, this is the container level, and you can see that we have a lot of microservices here. Now, it doesn't have to be microservices. If you have a monolith, you can still describe it by dividing your monolith into different domains and how those domains function. But in our case, we're, we are using microservices, so this is how it's depicted here. Now, we're gonna start with a similar flow. So the rider requests the write, and it's going to go to Riders app. So Uber actually has two different apps for drivers and for riders. The customers like us want to request the ride. And this request is going to go through an API gateway. Now API gateway is perfect for authentication, authorization, routing, setting CSP headers for security, for routing the request back and forth. And we don't want to have all of these security logics within our services, for example, the trip service, because our services should only handle the business logic. So the API gateway is taking care of all of that. And then the API gateway is rerouting our request to a trip service. Trip service in this case is an orchestrator. So it's going to asynchronously send the request to different services, gather all of them, and then make a decision. So let's see how this is gonna work. So the trip service is going to, first of all, save some data in its own database. Now its database is called trip database and it has a special type of a database. So it's an event store database. Event store databases are perfect for event sourcing 
design pattern. Event sourcing is different from relational databases or how relational databases are supposed to use normally because event store is saving records as uh, immutable objects. So for example, in our case, we have writes and every write has four or five different states. Write requested, write has started, write accomplished or write ended and payment completed, something like that. So in order to be able to trace all of them back and be able to reproduce for legal reasons and for accountability, we want to be able to store all of these changes within our event sourcing database. And event store is a perfect database for that. Now you may ask, why are we actually needing this? Well, there are some use cases such as taxi, for example, Uber or banking, where you do really need to be very thorough with your data and the state changes. And this is why we're doing event sourcing here. The way we fetch that data, because for example, we want to fetch the last state of a particular ride, we're gonna be using a normal Postgres database with materialized views for that to be able to aggregate that data from a, an event store database that we have. The next thing the trip service is gonna do is contact the pricing service. The pricing service is giving us a whole price of the help of the ride. And it's going to do this with the help of the demand forecasting service. So the demand forecasting service is one of those AI services that's going to do the forecasting for the search because during the rush hours, our taxi should cost more and demand forecasting service is going to calculate which area of the city are more in demand during the rush hours and so on. And it's going to do this with the framework called Profit. Profit is from Meta, or back then it was by Facebook, and it's perfect for time series because this search is going to, or surge in the price, is going to be calculated as a time series over many days, over many months. And this framework called Profit is actually perfect for forecasting data based on the previous data. So time series, so to say. As soon as we have this forecast, the pricing service is going to save this data in its own Postgres database for auditing reasons, and then going to send it back to the trip service. Now, I previously mentioned that it's an asynchronous service, and in Ice Panel, you are actually able to add some tags. For example, these lines that I'm showing now have a tag called async, and I basically labeled them as async, so you can turn it on and see which ones are async, and the blue ones are gonna be sync ones. Not only you can add tags in Ice Panel, but you can also tag it as technology. So for a particular technology, in my case, RabbitMQ, you're gonna see that some lines are orange and they're orange because these are requests that are going through a RabbitMQ message queue. So the trip service is going to publish a message, which means pricing service and matching service in this case are listening to, are subscribing to a specific topic in order to be able to receive this message. In this case, the pricing service is simply going to send this message back to the trip service. And now the trip service has the pricing for it. Now the trip service is going to send a request to the matching service to be able to match a driver for a particular rider. Now the matching service is going to interact with the Maps API. We're gonna talk about this because we need to dive deep into the matching service. It's probably the most interesting service in our architecture and we're going to save the data in a cache, which is a Redis. Actually, funny enough, Uber is using Redis for this particular case, so it's quite interesting. And it's saving it because drivers are being scanned every minute or every second rather for their location. So their locations are streamed into a database where people's locations are matched against driver's locations to be able to find the shortest path and Redis is perfect for this because we can do it much, much quicker with a caching system. Now, matching service is also going to contact the ETA prediction service. Now, this is an also AI service, which is going to calculate how long it's gonna take a particular driver to arrive to our pickup destination. A prediction can be done with something called an XGBoost. XGBoost is basically a tree boosting algorithm with a gradient boosting. And the cool thing about that is it's a very established framework. And if you go to Kaggle competitions, which are basically machine learning competitions, 
XGBoost is used extensively and it has a very good record of doing regressions. So finding out a specific number based on some variables. How it looks under the hood, it's basically decision trees, not only one, but multiple decision trees. And then their results are weighted for a final result, as you can see here. Now for this, I would go with a decision trees or like XGBoost if the interviewer would ask me what technology I would use for that. Now going further, we're simply going to publish the matching or specific match for a specific rider back to the trip service. Now trip service has the price as a match. Now we simply need to contact the ETA prediction service again to estimate the whole duration of the trip because we also need that to show it in the app. And finally, we're going to publish a message to the notification service that, hey, you can actually notify the customer that the driver has been found. This is gonna be the price and also the payment service because we want to complete the transaction at the end of the ride. Now the payment service is in fact going to use the fraud detection service in place for a check whether the transaction is fraudulent or not. And we can do it with a simple deep learning network or a, another name would be a multi-layer perceptron. So it doesn't have to be anything fancy. As you, and as you can notice, there are no LLMs used in this architecture. So don't make a mistake. And by adding an LLM, there's no need, at least in this scope, to add any LLMs. And finally, we're gonna use Stripe to complete the payment transaction. Now the trip service has all of this data and this is pretty much it. This is pretty much the biggest flow, but the interesting part is also within the matching service. So let's drill down into the next level to see how the matching service would work. So the matching service, if we go to our C4 model, is the component model. So we're going inside the microservice to see how different files or controllers and services within a specific microservice would work. So going back to the matching service. So let's start the flow because it's much easier to understand. So our candidate fetching worker is basically a class, a C sharp class that's going to listen or subscribe to a particular topic and got finally going to get a message from the trip service that, hey, this user needs a match or a driver. Now the candidate fetching worker is going to request some data from the maps API to pull the geographical data based on rider's location. And how's it doing? It's doing it with the help of an algorithm called geohashing. Geohashing is a method where you can encode coordinates in a simple string. How? It's basically dividing the whole map into smaller regions and it's going to continue to do that. And at the end, you are able to do some computations within these regions. Also, there's another type of doing that called quad trees. Quad trees are even more precise than geohashing. These are quite interesting algorithms. Let me know down in the comments if you'd like to learn more about that in one of my next videos. And also event sourcing. I'm gonna make a video on event sourcing next. So make sure to subscribe not to miss them. But basically, in our candidate fetch worker, we're gonna have all the necessary data when it comes to the geodata based on the rider's location. Now we're also going to pull the latest driver locations because I didn't mention that we, we also have a geo service, which is literally streaming the driver's location live into our Redis database or Redis cache. So we're gonna be able to fetch all of that data and it's not that difficult to do actually. Redis supports geospatial queries out of the box. So you can actually encode all of that data and you have some commands to basically add, find the radius, uh, do a search and so on. So it's pretty handy. So the candidate fetching worker has all of that data. And of course, as soon as we do have updated the driver's locations, we're going to update the cache as well. Now, the next thing is going to be the fact that we are sending those driver locations to a constraint checker. A constraint checker is also another C sharp class that's going to check the drivers for their vehicle type, for their accessibility needs, and so on. Maybe the car doesn't match the rider's requirements. And then the scoring engine, it's going to take all of that data and assign scores for a specific rider. How's it going to do that? Well, it's going to use the ETA prediction service, as we said before 
because it's also some of the data that we need to incorporate into our decisions. And it's basically going to, to give top three drivers to the assignment engine. Now the assignment engine has an election algorithm inside, which is most likely gonna top the, take the top one driver, but depending on some requirements, it can also take the any or out of those three drivers. Now we're going to publish the message back into our message queue, but at the same time, there's a feedback service that is going to update the Redis cache with the latest driver updates. So let's say if the constraint checker said that this driver does not have this type of vehicle and the ETA prediction said that this particular driver is somehow far away from the city, so his ETA is always, or her ETA is always gonna be too far, we need to save this in our Redis database. All right, and this is pretty much it. If you think you should you, or you would have done anything differently in this architecture, let me know. I'm very curious to learn from you as well. And if you enjoyed this video or learned something new, also smash like and subscribe and check out Ice Panel because it's a really cool tool that I think I would even introduce in my team. And I hope to make more videos like this. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.